so hi, uh, my name is Joe Savona. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Facebook, and I work on the Relay core team. Um, so today's talk is in two parts. Uh, first, I want to give a quick overview of what Relay is. Um, some of you may be familiar, uh, in which case, just bear with me. Some of you may be new to Relay, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page for the, for the rest of the talk. Um, and then the bulk of the talk will be about some new things for Relay. So more on that in a second. First, let's do a quick recap. So Relay is a framework for building data-driven applications with React and GraphQL. It's a lot of words. What does it mean? Well, the goal is for developers to specify what data is needed for each of their views. And then Relay figures out how and when to fetch that data. The idea is to let product developers focus on their product and not on building rep like repetitive, error-prone data fetching logic. We've all had to deal with like errors and retries and timeouts, and we can just solve that once in the framework and let developers focus on their UI. So in Relay, each unit of our application, each component, can specify its data dependencies via GraphQL. So we co-locate the queries and the, uh, the render logic that uses that data. Think of this like more advanced prop types. So again, quick concrete example. Here's a profile component. Um, so everything is cut off, huh? Has this? OK. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK. No? All right. Ah, nice. Try that again. I can never do a presentation without a, a brief moment of, that looks like most of it. Let's try this again. Woo. Yeah, there we go. All right, thanks for the help. All right, we got it out of the way. The, the display is all good now. We can go back to the talk. So thanks for bearing with me. Uh, all right, um, continuing the streak. I love it. OK. so. Profile component. We're displaying a user's name and their profile picture. Pretty standard stuff. It's a React component. Um, so Relay lets us annotate that with, uh, with GraphQL fragments. So here you can see that we're defining a fragment. Um, the user key corresponds to the user prop that the component expects. Again, we're using props.user. And so this is fragments.user. And then the fragment fetches name, profile picture, and the URI. So the shape of this exactly matches the data that we expected here. So Relay can then aggregate the data dependencies of all of our components, send that to the server as a query, get the data back and cache it, um, and then vend out props to our components. So again, we just focus on what data we need, and Relay takes care of this entire flow. So as you can see from this list, we're using Relay in quite a few places internally. This is just a, a sample. And we're also really excited by, to see a lot of interest from the community. Um, I'm especially excited about those, all those external contributors who have added things like everything from uh, documentation improvements, um, bug fixes, to some really substantial improvements to the core, uh, adding things like server rendering and React Native compatibility. So overall, we're really uh, pleased with the progress that we've made, um, but we're just getting started. We've gotten a lot of great feedback about what works and what could be improved. Um, and we're beginning to explore some new use cases for how Relay can help us build even better apps. So I, I want to touch on two areas um, that, we've been, that we've been thinking about. The first is mobile performance. So as we look at emerging markets, we see that the majority of users are on 2G or 3G uh, networks and are using older phones. And when I say older phones, I'm not talking about like last year's model. In emerging markets, a lot of people are using devices that would have been considered high-end in 2011. So these are quite, uh, quite a bit different than the devices that are likely to be in your pockets today. And our goal with Relay is to support developers in building apps that work on high-end phones and low-end phones, on good networks, and on slower networks. So this means doubling down on performance and also considering uh, working offline. So the second theme that we've been thinking a lot about is the developer experience. We've gotten a lot of good feedback about what works and what can be improved in Relay. Relay provides a lot of power to the developer, but it could certainly be a bit easier to use. 
Um, and the nice thing is that it turns out we can actually improve the speed and the developer experience by making a few key aspects of Relay more explicit. So if you've used Relay before, you'll kind of know, you, you might have a couple ideas of what I mean. Um, if not, don't worry, I'm about to show you. Um, but the, the, the basic idea is that by, develop, by the developer telling us a little bit more about what they want to happen, you get two things. A, the framework is doing less work, and in, quite, in fact, quite a lot less work. Um, and also, the developer, by being more explicit, understands what's going to happen more. So it's kind of a win-win situation. So these are ambitious goals to improve uh, mobile, mobile performance and the developer experience at the same time. And we knew that iterative, if iterative improvements would only get us so far, so fast. So this brings us to what we're referring to as Relay 2. Um, it's a ground-up rewrite of Relay that we've completed over the last few months. Uh, I say completed, mostly completed. Um, we're still finishing you know, some, some, some last bits. Um, it's optimized from the start for performance on low-end mobile devices, um, which of course means if we optimize for the, the lowest, the lowest, the lowest-end devices, that obviously translates to performance wins on higher-end devices too. Um, and we focused um, on simplicity and a more predictable developer experience. So Relay 2 is the best parts of Relay today. We're keeping the co-located GraphQL and React components because it makes our applications easier to reason about. And we're keeping the declarative API because it lets product developers uh, focus on their product and not on repetitive data fetching logic. But there's a lot that's new also. Um, I'm not going to read through this list because I'm about to go through it for the rest of the presentation. Uh, so these are just some fun things that I'll talk about next. As I talk about Relay 2, um, it's you know, I've talked about mobile performance, but it's helpful to have a specific uh, criteria in mind. And a metric that we care a lot about is what we call time to interaction, which I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, probably call TTI, time to interaction. Um, and you can consider this the time for when an application starts or when a transition starts from one screen to the next until we can see new content and interact with it. It's not enough to just be able to see the content. I want to be able to actually interact with it. So an example for the Facebook newsfeed would be that the first, uh, when the first story loads, and I can actually like or uh, share or comment on that story. So let's start by looking at the path to TTI in a React Native app and also on the web. Let's start with, uh, with React Native. So this is a, a really simplified flow of how we get from the application starting to rendering the first screen. And, and then, of course, being interactive. So first, we have JavaScript initialization. This is the, uh, the, the native app loading the JavaScript context, creating a virtual, like the virtual machine or interpreter, uh, loading the code off of the disk, parsing it, preparing it to run. At some point, all that's ready, and we're able to actually run our code. Now we get to the JS fetch, what I, uh, what I believe will JS fetch here. JavaScript runs, says, ah, we want to render a, cer a certain view. That view has some data dependencies. It figures out what those data dependencies are, constructs a query, sends it to the server. At some point, we get data back from the server, and we begin processing it. And this is the process of process. Uh, this means taking that data and putting it into our cache. Once it's, the data is cached, we can then render from that cache. Um, now, this is not really very specific to Relay. Um, if, you're doing, if you're using Redux or Flux, the JS fetch might be the initial process of sending off um, AJAX requests to the server to get data. The processing might be kind of normalizing that data into different flux stores. It's the same overall process. And in fact, the process is pretty similar on the web, right? Um, J JavaScript initialization uh, just means instead of loading code off of disk, we're actually downloading the JavaScript over the network. So for Relay 2, we considered how we could improve upon this flow. So certainly, we could optimize certain parts of this, uh, certain stages, and we have, and I'll get to that. Um, but we also considered the dependency between JavaScript initialization and the fetching, this transition here. So in Relay, our code expresses the, its data dependencies via GraphQL. And GraphQL is static. It's a text format that allows us to describe the data we need. There's no JavaScript logic mixed in. It's just GraphQL is its own language. So if we could fully exploit this property of GraphQL, we could potentially make the query much earlier without having to load up JavaScript. In current Relay, though, we have some dynamic APIs. We have some, some places where we actually do run a little bit of JavaScript in order to construct the query. And the same is true of uh, most other JavaScript GraphQL clients that, that we've seen. So to give a concrete example of this, 
Here's a slightly more complicated example of a relay container. So we have some friends list uh, component. And in orange, you can see the initial variables definition. And this is saying the count of friends. Uh, so friends list, we're going to fetch some number of friends. And count five is saying we're going to initially fetch five friends. The reason we're not hard coding this in the query is that later we want to be able to change this and fetch more friends. Now in blue, you can see the, this friend edge dot get fragment. And this is uh, composition. So just like React components can render other React components, in Relay, um, con parent components can compose the data dependencies of their children. And this is how we're able to fetch all the data for review in a single trip to the server. So in both cases, the initial variable is in orange and the, this composition in blue. Um, we're actually running JavaScript code, right? That count is a JavaScript, is a JavaScript object, and this is a string interpolation in blue. In Relay 2, we've embraced the static nature of GraphQL. For the few places where we have some dynamicism in Relay today, we've, um, we've actually added Relay-specific directives. This is a, a language feature that allows you to kind of augment GraphQL with, with, um, with your own behavior. Um, so we're effectively polyfilling GraphQL to add a, a few features that we need for Relay. Um, so now the initial variables that were before in JavaScript are now able to define via these, this argument definitions directive and again specify the default value of five. Um, and for the fragment composition, we just use standard GraphQL syntax, which is dot, dot, dot. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of object spread um, in JavaScript, but it, it allows us to compose a child fragment. So of course, we can't send this to the server, um, so we wrote a compiler. Um, Basically, it takes all the GraphQL documents across our entire code base and runs them through the compiler. Uh, and the, the compiler is basically running a sequence of transforms on that code, taking the relay-specific directives and getting rid of them, um, doing a bunch of optimizations in order to say, oh, you're fetching ID twice. Let's just fetch it once instead, things like that. At the end, we get out standard GraphQL that conforms to the, to the uh, specification and can be run on any GraphQL server. So going back to our example, we've now broken the dependency between JavaScript initialization and uh, data fetching. So we can do this instead. We can have native code. The native code knows what screen we're going to uh, open first when our application starts. And what we've just shown is that we can know statically what data will be fetched for any given screen, which means we know statically what data to fetch as soon as the application opens. So while the JavaScript is initializing, we can begin fetching code in parallel. Um, depending on how fast the fetch is, that might complete bef even before JavaScript is finished initializing. It might also take a little bit longer to fetch the, uh, the data, but even still, we started much earlier. And in fact, this process can be used on the web too. We're beginning to explore what this uh, would look like. Now, remember, when we talk about time to interaction, this is a little bit different than, you know, you may be used to um, server rendering, where you render some data from the server, and then you begin booting up the application on the client. Well, if we really care about TTI, actually being able to interact with that content, the idea is that we want to do as little work as possible along the way to making the content interactable. And so this server preloading can allow us to do that. So we don't have to actually render the application on the server. We don't necessarily need JavaScript on the server. Um, we can begin downloading our JavaScript, and in parallel, the server can begin giving the client all, the all of the data, because it knows what data the, the application needs. Um, as soon as the, the client is ready, it can just begin processing that and rendering it faster. So um, we've seen that static queries allow us to do some really nice optimizations um, and actually skip a lot of work at runtime and do that work at compile time instead. But it also lets us do more. We can actually optimize the remaining work, for runtime work, ahead of time at, at, the, uh, at build time. So here's an example of what I mean. Um, we've created a benchmark of the time it takes to process, to take the data off of the network and put it into the cache for a complex newsfeed story. Um, this is a, real, like, a query from a real app fetching real data, and we ran this benchmark on a low-end mobile device. So it's a 2011 year class device. So in current relay, processing that is 50 milliseconds for a single story. And now remember, this is a really low-end device. Obviously, current relay is quite a bit faster on a, on a, on a higher-end device. But for the same device in relay two, five milliseconds. So this is obviously a pretty big, uh, you know, over, uh, you know, just objective performance increase. But it also means that we're now under the 16 milliseconds for a single frame, leaving a lot of time for animations and rendering logic to run as well. 
So static queries, what does this mean? It means we can do less work at runtime, and we can optimize the remaining runtime work ahead of time. And we're still beginning to, we're just beginning to explore the optimizations that are possible here. We've got some fun ideas that, we, that I think we can uh, make that, that five milliseconds at least go down a, bit, a little bit more. So next, let's look at client state. Um, this is data that is local to a particular device or session and that we don't want to sync with the server. Um, the canonical use, you know, the, the canonical example of client state in, in React apps is things like Flux and Redux. Um, but let's consider how using those, uh, using those types of solutions can affect our TTI. So, so far, we've got this really nice optimized prefetching, right? But let's say that we need a single piece of data from, the, from client state. Well, what, the, what does that mean? It means that our, our, our nice initialization stage gets a bit longer because now we have to load more JavaScript code. We have to actually load up the JavaScript code defining our flux stores or our Redux reducers. Um, maybe we've got, we've actually have to like deserialize some data off of the disk because we cached that, that data last time. Again, we're doing more work. Not necessarily bad. If that works for you, keep doing it. Um, but what we've found is that with Relay, a lot of the state that people currently have in their applications actually goes away. There's a lot of state that's devoted to handling retries, uh, pending loading states, errors, timeouts, things like that. And with Relay, with Relay handling the data fetching for us, we're left with just the domain-specific uh, data, which is a lot less. So if that's true and if that matches your use case, we've built in support for client state in Relay 2. And what this allows is, uh, what this means is that Relay can then optimize the loading of that client state along with the, um, the server data. Um, so again, the actual like, relative improvement here may or may not actually be a benefit depending on your application. Like I said, if, you, if you're happy with Flux, Redux, whatever you're using, keep on using it. Don't feel fatigued, please. Um, just enjoy the talk. There's pretty colors. Um, <laughs> or actually, that was supposed to be red, not orange. So they're not as pretty as I intended, but yeah. Um, anyway, we think it's simpler to have an integrated approach to client and server state if you want it. So if you want it, use it. And here's how it works. Um, kind of a slightly different example, a story header. And the story header component is going to show a slightly different UI if the user has already seen that story on that device. Again, it's, we care about whether the, the user has seen it on that device or not. So this isn't something that would get saved to the server. So wouldn't it be convenient if we could just like, have this annotation on the story, has viewers seen? So we made this work. And the way it works is that separately, you define client extensions to your server schema. So you can hear this is standard uh, GraphQL syntax supported, um, supported basically by the, the GraphQL parser. We can extend the server's story type and tell it about this new field. And the Relay2 compiler is smart. It knows that this is a client extension of the server schema, and it shouldn't actually send that has viewer seen field to the server where the server would reject it, right? Um, but it can keep the, that field in the data that in, the, in its kind of like local description and, and actually read that data out of, its, uh, out of its cache. So basically, it just magically works and you get access to this, uh, to this field. But of course, we have to actually write the value at some point, right? When I actually see the story, we need to update the store. So I'm going to introduce the, this, this new Relay2 environment uh, API. Um, and basically, the environment is an encapsulation of all of the client state. So it's kind of a single instance of a relay store. Now, to, to, uh, to actually set the value of this field, we call environment.write. And we give it a, uh, a callback. If you've used promises, a new promise, and you kind of you give it a, a function, it's a lot like that, or calling for each with, uh, with, a, with a lambda. The updater is, uh, I feel like there's some static. Well, oh, well. OK, uh, so this, we get past an updater object. And the updater object is kind of a proxy over the store. It lets us do things like get and set values on the store, except that we're actually not directly modifying the store itself. A little bit more on that in a second. For now, I can get the story by its ID, and I can set the value on the story. It's a nice, simple, imperative code, um, fairly you know, straightforward expression of the logic that we want. We want to toggle a Boolean. We can do it in a couple lines of code. Um, and obviously, we'll have. Um, we have some current things in Relay that allow you to do complex mutation configuration. We also plan to continue supporting those. This is kind of an escape hatch for when you need to do something imperatively, and the other forms of mutations don't allow you to express them. So 
This brings us to mutations. In Relay 2, mutations are arbitrary. Like I said, there's configuration helpers that let you do common things easily, but if you need it, there's an, there's, there's, uh, there's an escape hatch. So the API is, just, is what I just showed, but let's see how that actually works behind the scenes. So we're actually given this updated object is really a proxy to the real store. When I call get, we're reading through from the store and then returning the value to you. When I call set, we're not actually directly modifying the store. Relay begins building a change set of all the things that you actually want to change in the store. It also actually builds a second change set, and that second one is a backup. It's the change set of how to get back to the state before the, the other change set is applied. So what this means is, at the end of that function, Relay has these two change sets, and it applies the change set to the store. And now all of our views update with the new logic and everyone sees has, uh, that, that we've now uh, seen the story. If I want to roll back that mutation, I can apply the backup to the store. I can cancel the, the mutation, and Relay will apply the backup, and now we're right back to the state that we were in before. So this is mutable data, but in immutable architecture. So it's kind of giving us the, the, the best of both um, mutability and immutability. We get, in general, we get the, like, the higher performance of writing to a mutable JavaScript object, um, but at the application level, we get the benefits of immutability with rollback and undo. So in Relay 2, mutations are arbitrary. Um, it's imperative object-oriented style API, but it, in, behind the scenes, this is actually building a description of the changes we want to apply, and that means we can do rollback, replay, undo, redo. So next, let's look at garbage collection. So this time, let's consider the flow as we transition from one part of the application to another. We've been using the application for a while. A lot of data has built up. There's, you know, memory is kind of, memory usage is growing. Um, and when we get the new data back from the server, now we've got even more memory used. And on a, on a low end device especially, that can mean that we now have hit kind of memory pressure and the JavaScript virtual machine is going to run garbage collection. Now, I don't mean to imply that JavaScript garbage collection is like super slow necessarily, the JavaScript virtual machines have really optimized the, the amount of time spent uh, doing garbage collection. But even though it's really fast, on a low-end device, fast is still not that fast. Um, so there isn't much we can do to improve on the JavaScript garbage collection. It's part of the engine. Um, but we can do something else instead. And that's to run the garbage collection at a different time. So we don't have control of when the JavaScript garbage collection runs. But we could take memory pressure away in order to not like, run into that at the wrong time. So in Relay 2, we've built integrated garbage collection into the system. And what that means is that we can optionally, um, when we know it's a good point, like a transition, right? we're going to be showing a loading spinner and waiting anyway. So we can run the, the Relay garbage collection to reduce memory. Now, these are not identical things. The JavaScript garbage collection is all of the objects on the, on the heap, right? Any string or object or array that you've created, that's uh, eligible for collection by the JavaScript virtual machine. The Relay garbage collection is specifically focused on the, the cache of objects that Relay has built. However, that can be quite a bit of data if you've been using the application for a long time, and by shrinking the, the uh, Relay, Relay uh, cache, that can help reduce overall memory pressure and avoid the need for a JavaScript garbage collection. And so even if the Relay garbage collection is actually slower than the native one, the key is that we can run it at a more opportune time and avoid garbage collection at a, at, at the bat at a wrong time. So kind of to help ground what this is actually doing, imagine that we have a, a set of components here on the right, and they're backed by some data in the Relay cache on the left. Ima now imagine that these media components are about to get unmounted, and the data that they're referencing is marked in red in the graph. When the media components go away, we're now left with this data that we don't strictly need for any view. And Relay Garbage Collection is able to simply remove that. So Relay 2 Garbage Collection, we're evicting objects based on what is actually referenced by views. It's optional, and the product is in control of the timing. Uh, and it's zero overhead when it's not used. So basically, if you don't want garbage collection, if your app doesn't fetch that much data, you get great performance, everything's fine. Um, if you have a, like, collect a lot of data and have users with really long sessions, you can choose to use this at, at a kind of like key points in the application lifecycle in order to reduce memory usage. We're also exploring TTL for objects to kind of give you more control over what gets garbage collected first. All right, offline caching. I know that a lot of people are interested in offline, so let's look at disk caching. 
And there's kind of two use cases for this. Um, the first is for people who are on slower networks. So a lot of people are on 2G and 3G networks. And that means that even if we do that fetch really early, it could take two seconds to get the data. It could take even longer. Um, and that means that we're, we have this idle time where we could be showing something to the user, but we're not. With discaching, with uh, caching results from previous sessions, we can show that data a lot sooner. We can show the cache data while we wait for the network data to come back, and again, show something to the user a lot sooner. And if that network, if, the, if that fetch fails because there is no network, we've already shown something to the user. Now, API for this is fairly straightforward. Um, when we create the relay environment, we provide two, uh, two functions, a load function and a save function. Uh, load takes a key and a callback. Um, and the idea is that basically we've previously given you data for that key, call us with the callback when you have pulled that data back off of disk or wherever you put it. Save takes a key and an opaque value, and it's your job to just save that somewhere and so that you can give it back to us when we call load. What, and then Relay takes care of the rest. And so the way that works is, let's say we're, uh, we're querying and the first field is actor. Well, we know what the, Relay knows what the, what the root ID is, and so it calls load with the, the actor ID. Your load function gives Relay, da uh, relay the data back, um, and we can then go to the next set of fields, hometown and friends in this case. So Relay is gonna do maximum parallelism and it basically attempt to explore the full graph as fast as it can. So it'll call load with both of these IDs in the same event loop, allowing you to try to fetch as much data from your caches as fast as you can. Similarly, when you update a value, when we call set at the end, Relay knows what records are new and what records have changed and it can call save with those new or updated records. So Relay2 disk caching, we're getting maximum parallelism, very, very efficient reads. Um, we're loading only what is required for view. So if you're doing kind of offline caching with Redux or Flux, you might be basically kind of pulling all of the data for an entire store off of disk. Maybe you're doing something more efficient, um, but like it, it's kind of a lot more complicated to write um, efficient or, um, data loading. With Relay, the framework handles that for you and loads only what you need. It's all orchestra orchestrated by Relay, and the user just provides these two load or save functions. So next, uh, let's talk about one more fun thing, connection streaming. So what do I mean by that? Well, most of our applications fetch lists, right? Almost, pretty much everything is you know, contact list, email list, et cetera. And when we, when we fetch data for a list, we often do something like this, where um, we fetch two or three items, in this case, let's say two, we process all of that data, and then we render all of that. Well, the problem is that we're not rendering the first new item that we've downloaded until we've processed and fetched everything. So theoretically, it seems like we should be able to render at least something sooner. And with Relay2, we can. So we've built a client-side and uh, also usable on the server uh, batch implementation. What this allows us to do is fetch things in a bit more fine-grained fashion. So here, you can see that we're fetching and we're getting data back twice. And as we get the first item back, we can process that only that first item and then render it. Then process the second item and render it. And this allows us to, again, show the first thing to the, the first uh, piece of data to the user sooner and, of course, be interactable. The way that we enable this is also fairly straightforward. So there's two, uh, two parameters that you can supply to Relay. The first one, fetch, is required. And this is just given a single query and its variables give us a promise for the results. You have to supply this because you have to, we don't know how to get data from your GraphQL server. We don't know what its URL is, what the authentication parameters are. The second is optional, fetch batch. If you don't provide this, Relay will basically simulate the ability to do um, more efficient networking um, via multiple round trips. But either way, everything, all the, the same API just works. You can optionally provide fetch batch, and this basically takes a, a simple data structure that describes um, different queries and how they're related and can fetch them in a single round trip from the server. So if you want to and get to get, to, you know, to get better performance, you can enable this, um, but if not, you can just apply fetch and Relay will um, basically simulate fetch batch for you. So to kind of give an overview, we've got static queries that allow us to fetch, uh, fetch data much earlier in the process. Um, Arbitrary mutations that allow you to, to, to basically express anything that you want via an imperative style um, while still getting the benefits of mutability and immutability. Um, supporting client state. If you like your current solution, use it. Um, but we think that this, this could be really good for a, lot of, for a lot of use cases. 
garbage collection, which is really helpful for, uh, for larger apps or apps that are, have like really long sessions, offline caching, connection streaming, um, that whole batch thing that I just talked about for connection streaming, that also lets us do deferred queries, where we can fetch some data that's required and then also uh, kind of separately fetch uh, less important data in a separate request. Um, that is supported in Relay, but we only support it internally today. In Relay 2, that'll just work in open source. So Relay 2 is simpler, it's faster, it's more predictable, um, and it's coming soon to open source. Um, we will bring it to open source as soon as we've got it used in production a little bit more and polished uh, some rough edges. Um, I want to note that while we're calling this Relay 2, the product API is really similar to Relay. It's containers, renderers. Um, if you've used Relay already, this will not be, you know, like the, the main, the concepts all translate really well. Um, and we think that this is just easier and simpler for, for people to use and allows you to build better and faster applications. And that's why we're kind of pursuing this approach. Um, as I've mentioned in the recent blog post, we will open source uh, the, kind of the tools that we use to help migrate from current Relay to Relay 2. So we're exploring things like code mods, um, kind of some interop APIs, kind of maybe, uh, maybe backporting some of the Relay 2 stuff to Relay 1. But again, we'll try to share as much of that as we can with the community. Um, so questions, um, I'm on Twitter, I'm on GitHub, uh, reach out. Um, also, feel free to you know, check out the, uh, I probably should have put the link to Relay, but Google it. Um, thank you very much.